Hi guys, this is the ASMR Nerd, and today we will be continuing our soft spoken reading of Martin the Warrior, A Tale of Redwall by Brian Jakes. Last time we left off at chapter 6. And so that is where we will be starting today. Skullrag the fox watched as Badrang tore at a roasted seabird and drank deeply of the good damson wine that Clog had brought him. When the tyrant stoat had eaten and drunk his fill, he wiped his mouth daintily on a dock leaf and nodded at Skullrag. Make your report. The fox swallowed visibly, then spoke, moving from paw to paw as he did so. Badrang had that effect on most creatures. His swift mood changes were a byword amongst the horde. Lord, there are no signs of clog in his ship. The sentries are keeping a sharp eye out day and night. The prisoners in the hall have some sort of sickness, Lord. It may be fever. A blue hide and lump back are taking stock of the armory. Everything else is quiet and in order. There's nothing more to report. Badrang poured himself a little more wine. Fever, eh? That young mouse brome, he must have brought it with him. Pity. I was going to have some fun with those three, make an example of him. Still, fever is good enough lesson to the slaves. Throw the wrongdoers in the pit where they'll catch the fever. What a clever idea. Slaves getting fever from slaves. They can't blame us for that, eh, Skullrag? <laughs> the fox laughed nervously along with his master. Badrang suddenly stopped laughing, leaving the other to carry on. Skullrag's thin giggle trailed away as the tyrant's eyes hardened. I've just had another clever idea, Skullrag. In my, if my fortress isn't finished by the end of the summer, I might just throw a few of my captains into the fever pit to rot. That liven their ideas up. What do you say? Skullrag could feel his paws beginning to shake uncontrollably. A, a splendid idea, Lord. Rose waited until the wall guard changed. There was a considerable interval when no beast was on the wall top, and she took advantage of this to sneak up to the fortress. Facing the center of the gate, she measured out twenty paces to the south. Marking the wall with a piece of charcoal, she dodged back to wall or back to the cover of the rocks. Grum was waiting for her. He nodded over the X marked on the stones of the fortress wall over to the X marked on the stones of the fortress wall. Be that it, Miss Roser. She nodded, watching him sizing the area up. Rose trusted Grum to do the job swiftly and silently. In all the country, there was no stronger digger than her friend. The mole scratched the tip of his button nose. You're taint easy, but taint hard neither, miss. You see the rock over there? It was another rocky outcrop, similar to the one they were hiding behind. Rose let Grum explain his plan. Well, that the rock be on straight line with thy marker. I'll start digging from there. That wise a vermin garters on a wall won't see us, and you can spread the tunnel dirt behind the rock. The plan was perfect. It was but the work of a moment to slip from one rock to the other. Grum took one last look at the mark on the wall, muttering calculations to himself as he squinted at it. Then he held both his heavy digging paws to the earth and recited his good fortune charm. Luck to oi in every mole, and ever went to dig an all. Tunnel good for all I'm worth. Mole be best when digging earth. Rose was amazed at his speed and strength. 
Grum went straight down in a shower of pebbles and sand, widening as he went. The mouse maid sat and waited. Digging a flat oat cake from their pack, she munched it and sipped cold mint tea from a canteen. Soon, Grum called out to her. How do we jump down, your Missy? Hurry now. Without a glance backward, without a backward glance, she leapt into the hole. Grum caught her easily and set her steady. She looked up as he rumbled, But were that be exactly two mousy lengths? He was right. It was exactly the height of two mice. You're stand on Moya and climb out now, Roser. No sense in you getting dirty. What did your mama and dad say if I brought you back all mucked up horror? The mouse maid hopped out, assisted by Grum, and began strewing the rubble from the hole around as he dug steps into the side of it. Blowing sand from his snout, Grum eyed his work. Nothing fancy, but it'll do, hurry. He went straight to tunneling through the bottom side of the hole, in a direct line, faster than any two moles in the whole of Noonvale. Skullrag stood at the rear of Badrang's long hut, trying hard to stop his paws shaking after the interview with the tyrant. A bankful was idly pulling up weeds that grew against the side of the building. The fox watched him for a while before calling to him. A drop over here. The bank vole pretended not to hear, but worked his way along until he was close to Skullrag. The fox looked this way and that, making sure he was unobserved as he spoke out of the corner of his mouth. Well, what's happening in the compound, matey? I'm not your matey or any beasts, Drup answered without looking up. There's lots happening in the compound, but it'll cost you food and wine to find out. Skullrag looked at his paws. They had steadied somewhat. I know that. You'll find a roast fish and some wine here tonight, just under the corner there, where it usually is. Now tell me what's happening. Drup's voice was low-keyed and surly. I'm taking a chance doing this. If they ever found out, they'd kill me for sure. So I'd like a proper whole roast fish, none of your table scraps, and some of the dark damson wine and corsairs the corsairs brought when they paid a visit. Skullrag's eyes widened. How'd you know they brought damson wine? Drup sniffed. You'd be surprised at what I know. Well, do I get proper food? Yes, yes, get on with it. Skullrag chewed impatiently at a hand claw. Right, listen close now. There's three ringleaders, Hilgors the old hedgehog, Bark John the squirrel, and the young otter called Keela. These three are urging all the slaves to steal fish, crops, and also tools from the quarry, sharp stones, anything they can make into weapons. There's a plan of some sort to free Martin Feldo and another mouse from the prison pit. Keela has been doing something when he takes the food to the prisoners each night. Skullrag urged his informer on. Oh, what's the plan? What's Keela doing? Why do they need weapons? Still keeping his eyes down, Drup shrugged. I don't know how they plan to get them out of the pit, and I'm not sure what Keela's up to. But the general talk is that when they're free, they'll be able to help from the outside. Meanwhile, the others are collecting weapons against the day against the day when they get a chance to strike back at Badrang and all of you. That's all I know. I've got to go now. Skullrag placed a footpaw swiftly on Drup's neck, holding him still a moment. You've done well, Drup. I'll make sure the fish and wine are the best. But find out more. I need to know more. When will I see you again, my friend? The bankful struggled loose of Skullrag's paw and hurried off. I'm not your friend. I'll be in touch. In the gloom of the prison hall, young Brome was getting very depressed after the initial euphoria of contact with the outside had faded. He began to speculate miserably. 
Suppose they got caught outside the fortress. Where will we be then? Feldo tried reasoning with him. Don't be silly, Brome. Your sister and that mole aren't daft. They know what they're doing. The youngster was silent a while, and then he started again. They, they might have the directions wrong. Suppose Grum tunnels the wrong way. He could have missed this place by a few lengths. Just think of it, poor old Grum, digging and digging and getting nowhere while we sit down here twiddling our paws. Martin gave Brome a light thump on the back. Here now, what's all this gloom and doom for, young fella? You've already told us that Grum is the champion digger in all the country. Well, let me tell you, moles are amongst the most sensible beasts over or under land. If your friend Grum is a champion digger, why, I'd trust him with my life any day. So would you, eh, Feldo? Before the squirrel had a chance to answer, a spear blade clanged on the grating above. The three friends looked up. They could not see clearly, but Skullrag's voice was unmistakable. They say you've got the fever down there. How'd you feel? Sick? Dizzy? Sweating? Not very nice, is it? Feldo laughed scornfully. It doesn't hurt as much as that rock I hit you with, mon er, mange nose. Skullrag banged the grating with his spear butt angrily. I've half a mind to come down there and run you through with my spear. But you won't, will you, because you're terrified of catching fever. Feldo's answer came back mockingly. Skullrag thwacked his spear on the grating a few more times. You're right, Squirrel, I won't come down. But there's nothing else, Will, and that means food or water. <laughs> we don't feed useless mouths around here, nor do we play nursemaid to sick beasts. So you can all stay down there until you die and rot. The fox swaggered off, proud that he had won the argument. Martin felt a tear from Brome's cheek as it damped his paw. He threw an arm about the youngster. I don't know about rotting, but pretty soon he'll get a rotten surprise when he finds we're gone from here. Imagine the fox's face. Brome managed a sniff and a smile. <laughs> yes, and we'll be safe in Noonvale. Martin began kicking the side of the pit wall. Feldo caught on and joined him. Their foot paws thudded away at the packed earth wall. Brome squinted at them in the darkness. What are you doing? Giving, uh, <clears throat> giving your mole friend a little help and guidance. He's probably very sensitive to underground noises. Take no notice of us, Brome. Tell us about Noonvale. Where do you live? What sort of place is it? Are the creatures nice, and is the food good? Go on. As they listened, Martin noticed that Brome's heavy mood of sadness disappeared when he talked of his home. Uh, let me see, what sort of place is Noonvale? Well, it's a deep glade far in the forest, a secret place, you might say. At dawn, the sunlight comes filtering like golden dust through the oaks and sycamores and elms. It is quiet. You can almost hear the sounds of peace. Light blue smoke drifts up from the cook fire, cookhouse fires, mingling with the green leaves above. Soft mosses and dark green grass carpet its slopes, and there are flowers, columbines, foxgloves, bluebells, wood anemones, and ground ivy. Ferns grow there, too. Sometimes I would lie among them at dawn, catching dewdrops on my tongue. Feldo blinked back a tear, surprised by the young one's eloquence. Sounds like my kind of place, Brome. What about the creatures there? Ahem, <clears throat> the creatures. Well, there's my sister Rose, and me. Our father is Urenvo, chieftain of Noonvale, and our mama's name is Arya. We live with other creatures who have found Noonvale. Moles, squirrels, hedgehogs, even some otters. My father rules the Vale. He's always very kind, but sometimes he can be stern to naughty ones. You would like my mama, though. She's the best cook anywhere. Martin almost forgot his aching paws as he thumped away at the wall. Does she cook anything nice? 
She cooks everything nice, Brome sighed longingly. Mushroom and chestnut stew, wild onion and leek soup, spring vegetable pasties, nut bread, oat farl, wheat cob, all piping hot from the ovens. She bakes blackberry and apple tarts, plum maple pudding, elderberry pie with yellow summer cream, gooseberry preserved scones hot with a buttercup spread. Thuldo massaged his shrunken stomach as he wailed aloud. Stop, stop. I can't stand it. All that beautiful food. Mushroom and chestnut stew. Plum maple pudding. Oh my, <laughs> oh my aching teeth. Martin wiped a paw across his dripping mouth. Brome gave a loud chuckle as he mischievously continued tormenting his hungry friends. My father helps the moles and the hedgehogs. They brew all our drinks. Dandelion ale, strawberry cordial, chestnut brown beer. Oh, chestnut brown beer, stop, you little fiend, stop. Martin and Feldo beat their foot paws harder against the wall. Grum backed out of the hole, pushing a mound of earth before him. Rose cleared it away, helping the mole out into the late afternoon sun. You seem to be making good progress, Grum. Rattling his digging claws against the rock to clean off the loose sandy soil, the mole blinked his eyes against the sunlight. Oi, that I be, Miss Harai. I be a going the right way, too, Bar. They beasts be a banging like two drummers in a winter fair, going nice straight to em. Her, her, it won't be long now, Roser. Before midnight, I reckon. Rose wriggled excitedly. Midnight, wonderful! It should be fairly easy to get a, to get clear of Marshank under cover of darkness. Oh, Grum, you're a dear! The mole made his way back to the tunnel, murmuring to cover his embarrassment. Embarrassment. Oh, I bait no dear, I be a mole, and don't you forget it, Missy. And that is chapter six. Next time, we'll pick up with Chapter 7. But for now, we close the book for one more night. Except I forgot to put in the bookmark. It's an important part. Lots of food descriptions in that chapter. Brian Jakes always did love his food and I gotta say, the food he describes does sound awfully amazing. Maybe one day I'll try cooking up some of those creative dishes myself. A lot of it would be pretty challenging, though, I think. It sounds pretty complicated. Some of the ingredients might be a little difficult to come by. Anyhow, um, we're going to leave this here for tonight. Um, I always like to encourage people, if they like what they're hearing here, to go buy the book for themselves or um, buy the audiobook, which is just a really excellent production with great, uh, great voice acting. Really good. Anyhow, uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I look forward to having you back here for the next chapter of our reading, chapter 7 of Martin the Warrior by Brian Jakes.